Mizmor le David, Adonai roi lo exar bin adeshiar bitzeni, ame menuchot yenahaleni, nafshi shavev yancheni bemagle tzedek le manchemo, gam ki elech beget samave lo irarak yata imadi, shiftaka o mishanteka hemi yanachamoni, tarok le fanai shokhan neget sorarai di shanta vashemen roshi kosiravaya, akto vachesed yerdefuni koyime chayai, Veshapte bevet Aronai la orech yamim. Please join me in Psalm 23 in the English. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We gather here this afternoon. A very difficult time. It's hard to say goodbye to someone who we thought would always be there with us. And yet, today is really a celebration of a beautiful life. Today we remember with great love and admiration the life and the memories of our beloved Josephine Greenberger. Jo was a loving daughter, a loving wife, a loving sister, a loving mother, a loving grandmother, a loving great-grandmother, a loving aunt, and a loving friend. Every Friday night at the Shabbos table, it's traditional for children, for husband, for grandchildren to recite a section from our Bible called Eshet Chayel, a woman of valor, a tribute to the women in their life. And I think this was written for our beloved Joe. Eshet Chayel miyimsa v'rachot mitne mikra, batak ba lebala v'shala lo yaksar. What a precious find is a woman of valor a strong and righteous woman. Her worth is far beyond rubies. Her husband puts his confidence in her and lacks no good thing. She's good to him, never bad all the days of her life. She opens up her hand to the needy. She extends her hand to the poor. She is clothed with strength and splendor. She looks to the future cheerfully. She opens her mouth with wisdom. Her tongue is guided by kindness. She oversees the activities of her household and never eats the bread of idleness. Her children come forward and bless her. Her husband praises her, saying, Many women have done superbly, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty vain, but a God-fearing woman is much to be praised. Extol her for the fruit of her hand, and wherever people gather, her deeds shall speak her praise. Our rabbis teach that the day of one's birth excuse me, the day of one's death should be more precious than the day of one's birth. And the rabbis compare our lives to that of a ship. Oftentimes, if you think of a cruise ship or a new ship leaving the harbor, oftentimes there's lots of fanfare. You can picture the bands and the parades and the streamers. But the rabbis say, why is this the time when we are celebrating? Because no one knows what lies in the path of that ship, what seas and storms and obstacles are in its way. Oftentimes, when that ship returns home, after a long voyage, returning safely, there's not the fanfare. The bands and the parades aren't there. The porters are there to unload the cargo. The taxis are there to take everyone to their next place. But the rabbis say this shouldn't be for a person. It's not necessarily the birth when we should really celebrate. We should celebrate when someone has returned home safely. Someone whose life has navigated those obstacles, those challenges on the way. Someone who has lived that full life and returned home safely. That is the time to celebrate. And so we can say for Grandma Jo, for Gigi, for Aunt Josie, for Joe, for Josephine, for Yetta Pesha, she has returned home with a good name in peace at the age of 97. She's left behind many in mourning. Her children, Paul, Arlene and Fred, Dennis and Didi, 
the apples of her eye, her grandchildren, Marcy, Bart and Pamela, Douglas and Kristen, Daniel and Mary, Elissa and Drew, and Alana, and the diamonds in her crown, her great-grandchildren, Hannah, Benjamin, Kayla, Armanda, and Riley. Joe leaves her sister Elaine, brother-in-law Marvin. She now returns her to, to her beloved husband Harold, her daughter-in-law Janice, who died this past December, to her parents Joseph and Anna, to her brother William, sister Molly, sister Evelyn. She joins them all in their eternal home in heaven. We have some very special family tributes, one from each of the generations. We first like to call upon her son, Dennis. Thank you, Rabbi. I hope to get through these remarks. If I don't, you'll excuse me. The first time I was in this room was 53 years ago uh, when my father died. Uh, at that time, mom became a single mother. Just give me a moment. Uh, as devastating as my dad's death was, my mom rose to the occasion. She was strong and resilient. My mother's headstone is going to read 1922-2019. I've always been fascinated by what headstones say. Although the years are going to mark her birth and death, the real significant mark on her headstone is the dash between the years. As that represents the life she lived, I'll try to describe the dash today that really was her life. Uh, the life that my mom lived was characterized by love and family. Uh, ten days ago, ten days prior to her death, the last words my mom said to me were a question, which was, do you know how much I love you? I'll forever cherish those dying words and that question. It's a question, in fact, that she could have posed to all of her children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. She had unlimited love for those nearest and dearest to her, and it's difficult to understand how deep her love was. For those of you lucky enough to know my mom, you know nothing was more important than her family. Uh, she was happiest when she was with her children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, nieces, nephews, and extended families. She thoroughly enjoyed every moment of these get-togethers, and then sh she'd relive the memories of the event for weeks afterwards. She'd recount the stories that were told, the games that were played, any major or minor life change that may have occurred, and more importantly, the food that was served, course by course, excruciating option by excruciating option. My mom was a simple woman in many ways. She took pleasure in everyday events. She didn't need fancy dinners or fancy vacations. Uh, throughout the years when she visited us in California, she simply wanted to be part of the fabric of our everyday life. When my daughters, Elissa and Alana, were young, She relished giving them a bath or combing their hair. Her greatest pleasure of all was seeing what they were wearing in the morning and then dressing in the same color as they did. 
as they got older, she just wanted to go swim lessons or soccer practice or play three-thirds of a ghost with them. She made it to all the milestone events, and up until a few months ago, uh, really thought that she would be attending and dancing at Alyssa and Drew's wedding. My favorite memory was to watch the joy she had in being a grandmother to my daughters. She was truly involved and delighted at each stage of their development, from rocking them as newborns to holding their fingers when they were toddlers to being present at bat mitzvahs and graduations. Uh, each step of the way, she was at there and our side. I suspect that's the experience of everyone in the family had really knowing that she was there each step of the way. As a grandmother and a great-grandmother, as a mother, she was always at her side. My mother had an unwavering commitment and devotion to family. Nothing was more important. She taught me to value family above all else. She taught me the value of education and learning. She taught me by example morality, respect for others, enjoying the simple things in life, gratitude, forgiveness, and maintaining close and loving family relationships. She was a remarkable woman, and I'm lucky and proud to call her my mother. Over the last few days, I've asked people their favorite memories of my mom, and each of these memories was really doing simple everyday activities. She had the uncanny ability to infuse specialness into the ordinary and the mundane. People's favorite memories were things like baking, playing ping pong, dressing up, play acting, texting one another while sitting next to each other in a restaurant, <laughs> building a house of cards, playing cards, or just hanging out. These are the memories that people will hold close to their heart because my mother so highly valued these moments. Uh, the moments were an expression of what was sacred to her, of what drove her life, family and relationships. She had the ability to make these everyday moments special. And because of that, when we think of her, we'll remember these seemingly mundane moments that she was able to make sacred and special. My mother was blessed in that she was surrounded by more love than anyone I know. During the past several weeks, she was visited and comforted by each of her children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. People showing up and surrounding the bed she died in is a testimony to the tremendous mark she made on the world. My mom was very humble and unassuming. I don't I don't think she ever really understood the positive and profound impact she had on her family. My mom was blessed with a long and healthy life. She died soon after her 97th birthday, and she lived 95 and a half very healthy years. It was only in the last year and a half that my mom began to deteriorate physically and cognitively. She was really active for 95 or 96 years, and serves as my model of how to live and how to age. She lived long, she found writing, which she was passionate about. She was healthy, she loved tremendously, and she was loved in return. It's a blessed life that we all can aspire to. Um, my mom was on hospice care for the last two weeks of her life, and not this past weekend, but the weekend before, I was with my wife, Dee Dee, and Alana, and a random woman in a wheelchair at Menorah stopped us and began talking to Alana initially. And she was you know, talking about speaking 10 languages, and she started singing to us just out of the blue. And she sang uh, My Yiddish Mama um, to Alana, Dee Dee, and I. And I honestly had never heard the song before, but it turns out that the Part of the hospice service is the music therapy. And the very last song my mom heard a few hours before she died was My Yiddish Mama. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with all the lyrics, but in part, the lyrics say, I'd like to kiss that wrinkled brow. I long to hold her hands once more as in days gone by and ask her to forgive me for all the things I did to make her cry. Uh, 
how few were her pleasures. She never cared for fashion style. Her jewels and treasures, she found them in her baby's smile. I know that I owe what I am today to that dear little lady so old and gray. Uh, as you know, my mother was a short woman, uh, well under five feet tall. Uh, my sister Arlene described her as short and sweet. Uh, it was always a momentous occasion in the family when one of the grandchildren grew taller than her. She would announce it to everybody. There were many moments of standing back to back and resting a book on both heads in order to determine which way the book angled. Eventually, each grandchild grew taller and surpassed Grandma Jo in height. Although we outgrew her physically, there are many ways that we are never going to outgrow her, and we can simply aspire to live the life that she lived. Thank you. And now grandson Bart. Thank you all for coming today. I've decided to write a memoir. I want to share the story of my life. I don't have any notes. I don't have any stories. But by golly, I know the title of my memoir. The title is going to be, I am a descendant of the middle finger. Josephine, <laughs> Josephine Pearl Finger was in first grade. This was approximately 1928 when she had to do a report about her family. She stood in front of the entire class, like I am in front of you today. She held up her hand proudly, and she announced, I am the middle finger, just like this. Yes, my grandmother was the third of five children, and she was very proud of it. By the way, when she told us that story, she also informed us that she got in trouble, got sent to the principal, and her father was not very happy about it. <laughs> Grandma Jo, or Graham, or Grams or Gigi, as we always referred to her, grew up and lived in Cleveland her entire life. She married Harold Greenberger, and they had three children. Graham has six grandchildren, three boys, three girls, and yes, I was the favorite, but don't tell anybody. She also has five great-grandchildren, as, as UD, as Uncle Dennis mentioned. Harold passed away at the age, the young age of 46, just three weeks before my parents' wedding. Grandma was alone for the past 52 years, but I promise you she was never alone. She had her children, her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren, and her hobbies. She loved writing short stories to all of her grandchildren and great-grandchildren. She took a writing course to improve her writing. She also loved reading, and for years she volunteered in many schools reading to the kids. I loved talking to her on the phone, and, and every time... We'd hung up, we would get ready to hang up, I'd say, I love you, Graham. And her response was always, I love you more. Still makes me smile. Grandma lived a fantastic life. She battled many things and even in death was a fighter. Yes, Grandma was stubborn. My, one, my wife wonders where I get it from. But that helped her live the life that she wanted to live. She lived by herself in one apartment or another for many years until her kids finally were able to convince her to move into a retirement community. She would have been about 91, I think we determined on, on the ride over here. I visited her the weekend after she moved. And by the way, it was like 58 below zero here in Cleveland, absolutely ridiculously cold. And Grandma used that as a sign. She was a little hesitant to move in there. Several months, about a month later, I called her on the phone. And her exact words to me were, I should have moved here 10 years ago. She loved it. She always had someone to talk to, someone to eat with, someone to hang out with. And when she wanted to be alone, she just went back to her apartment. At the time of the phone conversation, I'm, who, I'm in sales. I was calling on a retirement community in rural central Illinois. So I completely changed the commercial idea that I had for this retirement community. A week later, I gave a presentation to their entire board. I told them the story of my 90, 91-year-old grandmother, and I said, your new tagline should be, I should have moved here sooner. The board bought it on the spot. 
In fact, they used it for three years. They sold out every single room in their retirement community, which was about half full before I got there. Almost every time I talked to Graham, you know what she wanted to know? Bart, where's my commission check? <laughs> we always laughed about that. Grandma was young at heart, even if not in the body. My son, Benjamin, would have been about five or six, and Grandma was visiting my parents' house in St. Louis. She challenged Ben to a ping pong game. Keep in mind, Graham would have been about 85. We don't know too many 85-year-olds challenging a five or six-year-old to ping pong. Ben hit a shot. Grandma tripped, fell, hit her back against the concrete wall. We found out weeks later she broke her back. It was nothing that Ben had done, but Ben had felt guilty for years. But also for years, we would always ask Graham, you want to play ping pong? Surprisingly, she always said no. As Dennis mentioned, she turned 97 a couple of weeks ago, but that's not how I referred to it. To me, Grandma Jo was 35,429 days old, not 97 years old. Marcy and Dad were visiting Graham a couple of weeks ago, just a week or so before her birthday. Marcy told her, hey, your birthday's coming up, you're going to be 97. Grandma says, yeah, but what does the statistician have to say about it? Marcy realized she was referring to me. I pulled out my calculator, and I told her how many days old. We don't ever say, happy birth year. No, we say happy birthday. So if you're looking to play the lottery today, the number you want to play is 35,440 days because she lived every one of those to the fullest. It was a hell of a run. As we leave here today, just remember, remember Grandma's laugh. Remember her smile. As Dennis said, she was always happy. She just wanted to be with us. She's gone home now to be with her beloved Harold. She missed him so much, and now she gets to be with him again. Grandma, I love you more. And now from the last generation, great-granddaughter Riley. I'm Riley Eastman. Joe Greenberger is my great-grandmother, but I called her Gigi. Sometimes I called her Gigila. Every time I talked to Gigi, she would always share with me all the great things happening with my cousins in school and work. She was always so proud of her family. Gigi was always ready to play a game with me. I already miss my conversations with Gigi and her smile. She asked me to never forget her. There is no way that I will ever forget Gigi. She will always be in my heart. I love you, Gigi. -la. What more to say than to be eulogized by your great-granddaughter so beautifully? I'll share just a little bit more. Joe was the matriarch of the family, the energizer bunny, incredibly resilient and strong. She lived with joy, always grateful, always with a bounce in her step. She loved her growing family. She was fiercely loyal, an incredibly hard worker all of her life. She worked until her 80s, still with more energy than anyone. No one could match her, a little competitive, incredibly creative, a hip great-grandma with her smartphone, incredibly humble. She was charming, could talk to anyone and everyone, making lifelong friends everywhere, for Joe always had a smile on her face. As Dennis said, born and raised here in Cleveland Heights, confirmed at Heights Temple, graduating from Heights High, and though she wanted to go on to college and become a gym teacher, 
Her immigrant parents didn't want her to go to school. She listened to them and was soon fixed up on that blind date with Harold. They took a liking to each other. They say that she fell in love with his humor, and so did the rest of the family. And the rest is history, married with Rabbi Rosenthal from Heights Temple officiating. They had a wonderful marriage, a hard-working blue-collar family with strong Jewish influence. The family first lived on Solzer in Euclid and then moved to a Jewish neighborhood, Meadowbrook, in Cleveland Heights. You told me mom raised you with the right values, teaching you by example, stressing the golden rule. How mom was so proud of each of her children. She loved your spouses like her own. She's so proud of the families that you raised. And I know that the children-in-law felt the same. Didi, you told me that Joe was a lovely woman. Always so busy, you love when she would be with you in California. Family was everything. You already heard about the card games and the concentration and the ping pong. She loved that finger family. All the siblings and nieces and nephews and cousins, they were all so close. And when I prepared for her sister Molly's funeral service some four years ago, this is what Joe shared with me, how Molly, her big sister, always looked out for her. She told me how dear, sweet, and accommodating Molly was, how special it was for them to be together those times, and I know that that Finger family always remained so close. A hard worker, whether it was teaching Sunday school at Heights Temple or professional work as an executive secretary or HR manager, she was a full-time worker, housewife, and mother. An avid walker to the end, she'd do her laps from Stone Gardens to Myers, and she always received such great care across, across the Menorah Park campus. Her stories, which were published in that book, Cleveland Tales, for her birthday, she loved it. As Bart said, starting with those creative writing classes, she'd always do her research and write incredible short one-page stories. Each story always embodied the values of the greatest generation, always with a gram of truth, including some part of her, focusing on an important value. There was always a hero who emphasized humility and was always rewarded for good behavior. Joe liked to eat. Everyone's jaw would drop when they'd see her eating so much. They didn't know where she put it all. She was also an amazing cook and baker. Her kuchen recipe is cherished. She made the most wonderful cherry and apple pies. Her hamantaschen were the best, always rolling out the dough just so. Her jungle stew, Hungarian goulash. She was old school. I expect you to eat every single bite. Be disappointed if you didn't finish the entire plate. Even as Joe worked full time and worked hard, she was always punctual with dinner. As her health declined, she was content, extremely well cared for, always with respect and love from the whole family. You watched over her, making sure that she was still the family matriarch, still mom, still grandma, still Gigi. You made sure that she always received the best care, and you were there. She was never alone, always cared for with compassion and love. She passed away on a holiday, a Jewish holiday. You told me that she was born on a holiday, Memorial Day, and passed away on a holiday. Our rabbis teach that on such a day of joy and celebration, Shavuot, when we celebrate receiving the Torah or the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, when we receive our instruction, the laws of which we should live, the rabbis say, how could it be that someone could pass away, that there could be such sadness? And the rabbis say that someone who dies on a holiday is only someone who is truly righteous, someone who is truly merited and reached a certain status in life. We know that Joe was extremely special. She was a tzedeket, a righteous person, a person who lived her life the right way. And perhaps this is one of those rewards. She has returned home, like that ship that has returned to the harbor. We can rejoice in her good name, her smile, her bounce in spirit, her lasting legacy. May she always be remembered with love. Amen. We'll rise now for the memorial prayers.
El male rachamim shochen bam romim. Am semen el kanechona tachat kanfea shechina. Be malot kiroshim torim kezoraki amasirim et nishmat. Yet a pesha bat yakov a chayasora. Shochal olam o beganin and temenu choto no barachamim. Hasti de abasetek and afakali olamim. Exalted, compassionate God, grant infinite rest in your sheltering presence among the holy and pure to the soul of our beloved Josephine Pearl Greenberger, who has gone to her eternal home. Merciful One, we ask that our loved one find perfect peace in your eternal embrace. May she merit the reward for living a life filled with love, kindness, and righteousness. May her soul be bound up in the bond of life. May she rest in peace. And we say, Amen. Please be seated. Following our service, the interment will take place at Zion Cemetery, and then the family will receive friends at the home of Arlene and Fred Eastman, 506 Dogwood Lane in Chagrin Falls, today following our service until 8 p.m., Thursday from 1 to 4, and Friday from 1 to 4. Friends who wish may contribute to the Menorah Park Foundation Creative Writer Writing Program. <laughs> 